Jesus. There's freedom in this place this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. I give you the glory. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus.
said this I've said this often and I will say this all of my days I don't ever want to get over 
what God has done for me in my life. I don't ever want to become numb to his mercy. I don't ever want to become numb to his grace. I don't want to ever become numb to his faithfulness. When I have lived like a barnyard dog, God has still been faithful to me. When I have not been faithful to him, he has still had mercy. He has still had grace. He has still been kind. He has still loved me. In our darkest moments, his love has never wavered for one second. And that's why I will proclaim all the days of my life, God, you are good. God, I praise you. God, I worship you. God, I lift up your name. God, I love you. Come on, just for a moment, let's let him know that right now. God, we're thankful for who you are and for all you've done. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When I was when I was very young in ministry, you know, when you when you either first get in church or really when you first commit to church, because I've been in church my whole life. But you see, I was in church, the church was not in me. And when the church gets in you, when the Spirit of the Lord dwells in you. There's a zeal there. There's a fervor. There's a passion. There's a thankfulness. And I'll never forget having a, a conversation with somebody whom I respect and I completely understood where they were coming from. But he told me, you know, you don't always have to act like that. He said, you won't always run the aisles like you're running the aisles right now. And to a point that's true because in your walk with God, there needs to be a time when it's not zeal, but yes. rather it's love. Yes. Zeal and passion should always be a part of who we are. But there's going to be times when zeal and passion can't get you where you need to go. And you're going to have to really love God. And that's what he was talking about. But I don't ever want to lose my dance. Yes. I don't ever want to lose my shout. I don't ever want to lose my aisle running. I don't ever want to lose that because I don't ever want to forget what it was like when I didn't have it. I don't ever want to forget what it was like when I felt that feeling of forgiveness and mercy over flood me and just crowd me. And I realized that all of those times when I didn't care about God, He still cared about me. I, I don't ever want to lose that passion and that love for Him. Can we lift our hands all across this place right now? Lord, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you today. You, you're just going to have to forgive me for a moment. I, I'm going to get behind the pulpit in a minute, but i got to love on the Lord a little bit. I want you to know you're standing in the middle of the best church that you've ever been to in your life. This is a this is a good church, amen. This is a good local assembly, amen. Amen. And we're so thankful for what God is doing in our church. Let's give all of our guests and visitors a hand clap of appreciation. It's good to have Dan. Amen. Dan or Daniel? Daniel, when you're in trouble, right? <laughs> Amen. It's so good to have him today from my alma mater. He's a student at SIUC, our old stopping grounds. Amen, where we're, a lot of us are from. And then it is so good to have Paul back. Let's give both of them a hand clap of appreciation. I don't want to miss anybody. Amen. 
this church is so good, and I brag on this church because you made it better today. I mean that. I mean that. Yes, Amen. Amen. We are going to take up an offering here. We're going to go ahead and walk up the offering. Amen. We're going to take a moment. We're just going to play some music over the loudspeaker. I would love it if you would take a moment while we're walking up our offering here. If you could just go around and greet one another. We don't want to rush through this. Make sure and welcome our guests. Make sure and tell them it's good to have them today in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Take your time, and I mean this. I mean this. If you were here this past Wednesday, you know this, one of my favorite parts of the service. Amen. There is nothing like church family. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Isn't God good? Amen. God has been so good to each and every one of us. Before, before we do get into the word, how awesome was yesterday? Yesterday was a good day, amen? Yesterday was a good day for Truth Church. Thank you to each and every one of you who donated your time for about a 24-hour span from Friday afternoon. We saw evidence of a healthy church Friday afternoon, yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon because, well, this is just kind of a saying in Christianity, and I shared it yesterday, but I'll share it again today. Usually the norm is about 5 to 10% of the people do about 90% of the work. Amen? You don't have to amen that because we don't do that here. And it has been such a blessing to us. I, I just sat there thinking about it late last night in my office. We may be the opposite of that. Amen. We are a church body. We are a local assembly. And when we do something, we do it together. Amen? Amen. Give yourselves a hand clap for being a great church. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. If you could stand for the reading of the word, Brother Michael held out long enough. Y'all can join in now. Amen. 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 Praise God. So good to have each and every one of you here today. The future is very bright for this church, and we want you to be a big part of it. Amen. Once again this morning, we're going to be reading from the gospel of John. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I am going to thoroughly enjoy this sermon today, amen, because we're going to get right to the, the heart of the matter and, and, and things that, that we have encountered a lot over the last few years. We're just going to talk about some of them today. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to move to John chapter 19 after that. I promise I won't have you standing long, amen. Doesn't the place look great? decorated for Christmas. I, I told Sister Tammy, I said, simple and classy. We don't need a winter wonderland, but I do like Christmas decorations. Amen. Doesn't it look great? Didn't she do such a wonderful job? Amen. Amen. We appreciate that so much. John chapter 3 and verse number 1. This is a very important passage of scripture for doctrine, for truth. The Bible says, John is writing here and he says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus and he was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, he's talking to Jesus, Nicodemus is coming to Jesus by night. 
And he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Man, the Holy Ghost is just talking to me right now. Does anybody else here notice that nothing Nicodemus said had anything to do with what Jesus responded with? You see, this is just, I'm going to leave this out there. Sometimes, we, 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 all the time, we bring our needs to the church, we bring our needs to God. But the reality is this, God knows what we need more than we know what we need. Nicodemus is, is asking about these miracles, and, and he was intrigued by the, the teachings of Jesus. But Jesus said, before you need a miracle, you need saved. Amen. I, I just think that's intriguing. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, moving to John chapter 19, we will revisit John 3 later. But in John chapter 19, Jesus had just been crucified and after the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, the Bible says that, that after that, after this, the death, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus, and there came also Nicodemus. That's a fun name to say. Say it with me, Nicodemus. If we have a fourth child, we're going to name him Nicodemus, and we're going to call him Nico. I say that because I know we ain't have no fourth child. We better watch it. Amen. <laughs> Can I preach after I got rebuked? Is that allowed? Amen. There came also Nicodemus, there he is again, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus. So Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they take the body of Jesus and they wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never laid never man yet laid and there laid they Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea there laid they Jesus before Nicod before therefore because of the Jews preparation day for the sepulcher probably could have went without reading verse 42 but we're going to dive a little deeper this morning into somebody who is very prominent in biblical teaching Nicodemus is very prominent in biblical teaching, in apostolic truth, he's very important for what we read in, in John chapter 3. But we're going to take a little bit deeper of a dive this morning. We're going to focus on, on Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. He's a very big part of this. But this morning, we're going to discuss a shift in Nicodemus's life between John chapter 3 and John chapter 19. And it's a shift that every single believer must have at some point we don't talk about it very much but we must experience it amen i, I want to preach to you under this title this morning today we make a public declaration very simply that that is my topic and my title a public declaration i'm going to ask you if you would put your bibles down if we could lift our voices if we could lift our hands right now i pray in the name of jesus would you pray with me god i pray in the name that is above every other name, that you would have your way in the church today. God, do in this place what only you can do. I pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a declaration made today. I, I pray that there would be a declaration made today that when somebody leaves here, they walk in boldness and they walk in the authority that you've given them, God. I pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a shift like that of Nicodemus in the church today. In Jesus' name. Before you're seated, clap your hands to the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Praise God. 
Wow, we, I, I've been a little bit intentional about some of the things that we've just done in the last 30 seconds. Because some of the things that you hear in the church, clap your hands unto the Lord, amen, and, and we, we just do it, right? Yeah. We just do it. But something I, I really think the church needs to be mindful of is this. A lot of people have no idea why we do it. I, I, I'm going to have I'm going to have fun today, because God really and I, I can speak for my family, my wife, and to a point, our children. We we try to we try to teach them these things in a way maybe that that I just think it's appropriate. Uh, today we're going to have fun for a particular reason. We always have fun here, but today we're, we're going to answer some questions that a lot of people generally have. We, we say this often at Truth Church, probably haven't said it for a while, so I'll say it now. Questions are a good thing. Amen? Sometimes we just need to trust God. Sometimes we just need to trust mom and dad. Sometimes we just need to trust, you know. But I, 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 I've kind of learned over the years that we need to know why we do some of the things we do. Amen? Amen. Why does it matter so much? Today, these are some of the... The questions that we're going to answer, some of you have asked these questions over the last couple of years. Some of you have probably wondered in this service already, why Why are we doing this? What, what is going on here? Why is that guy doing this? Why is this individual doing that? We're going to answer questions like, why does it matter so much to come to the altar? Amen. We're going to answer questions like, why do we clap our hands? Clap your hands, everybody, unto the Lord. Amen. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to dispel some things. We're going to answer questions like, why does it vocalize or why does it matter so much that we vocalize our worship? Why do we shout? Why do we audibly say amen? Can I get an amen? Yeah. Come on. You see, th this is so important, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, because if we don't know why we are doing the things we do in church, then we are actually religious, not spiritual. Amen. Now, this is, I'm, I'm really excited about this today because one of the things that we have encountered at Truth Church, for those of you who don't know, we're only two years old. And when you come into, it's just been so enlightening to me that people who are raised in Christianity and, and raised in good church, good people who love God will come into our church services and not know why in the world we're doing some of the things we do. we got to be careful about this. We can't be so churchy that we can't relate to people. This is a very, very strong passion of mine. And, and I'm excited because today's the day that we gain some answers. Now, to be clear here, on, on the surface of these questions, I will tell you that there's a scripture for every single one of the things that I just mentioned. Amen. We don't want to be religious. We want to be biblical, right? Amen. On the surface of these questions, there's scripture. We're, we're going to dig a little bit deeper here to find answers to these questions, but understand first that the final answers will always come from the Word of God. So uh, just for a, a couple of examples here, just so we know we're in the Word of God, I will share with you. We lift our hands in worship because Paul said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. So it's biblical to lift our hands. We clap our hands because the psalmist wrote, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Amen. And the people would then clap their hands as a response to the man of God, the, the prophet or, or the priest or what have you. We shout hallelujah to the Lord because, you see, sometimes we, we can rely on the clap a whole lot. Let, let me meddle just a little bit as a pastor. Sometimes we rely on the clap a whole lot because it fills the dead silence. But can I tell you that your voice is more powerful than your hand clap? The Bible says that you can speak life or death into the atmosphere. Death and life lies in the power of the tongue. So sometimes we're, we're clapping and we're making noise, but we're not speaking life because we haven't. And oh Man, see, see how much fun I'm having here? The same psalm that says, clap your hands, all ye people, also says, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. There's an answer for every single thing you've seen in this church service today, and the answers all come from the Bible. Amen. We even believe, and this is when people really, this is when the learning curve started for me, okay? We came here, we're having church on the fairgrounds, and we, you talk about a group of wonderful people. We connected with some wonderful people who love God. It's an amazing story, but a lot of you probably haven't heard this story. We moved here, the pandemic started, 
And we launched a church. We moved here in February of 2020, and in March of 2020, everything shut down. You know, when you move somewhere to start a congregation, and then it becomes illegal to congregate, that poses a problem. But God... God set some things up. He set some things in order that gave our church a good start. And there was a group of people who were praying in their homes every Tuesday. And I'll never forget the message I got. And I told my wife this. I remember the look on her face when I told her this. I said, I got a message, and it said, we, we have a people who are studying the Bible, and we're praying every Tuesday, but we need a pastor in a home church. And I'm like... I know a guy. The very next Tuesday, we had 12, 13 people sitting in our living room, and that was the beginning of Truth Church. Every single Tuesday thereafter, we started midweek services. We started our first church service on the fairgrounds. But I'll never forget, I'll never forget that in one of those church services, these people who love God, and I have, they're wonderful people today. I pray they're watching because maybe, maybe we can explain some things here. But some would get offended because they didn't like it when people said amen at the same time. Some would get offended because there would be hand clapping going on. Some would be offended because when I would pray, other people would pray. Now, the Bible says magnify the Lord with me. But this became very real to me, Brother Jerry, because we had people leave Truth Church because of these things. And I'm telling you right now, these people love God. And these people are wonderful people. And it became very real to me that Christianity needed a revival that was produced from the Word of God and not what Christianity had become. Amen. It became very real to me because I started thinking of things like this. Man, if clapping hands gets on their nerves, what's it going to look like when somebody starts dancing? (laughs) If clapping hands gets on their nerves, what's it going to look like when somebody prays through and starts speaking in tongues in the altar? If if clapping hands is saying amen simultaneously, if they don't like that, what are they going to feel when somebody speaks in tongues for the first time and receives the gift of the Holy Ghost? I began thinking about these things, and I began preparing a message because guess what? We do believe in speaking in tongues. I'm just going to get it out there we do believe in the gifts of the spirit we do believe in dancing in the altar because it's rooted not in christianity it's rooted in the word of god can i tell you that before anybody was ever called a christian there was a shouting match in the altar of a church now it looked a little bit different and they didn't do things the way we did things but there was a prayer meeting where the gifts of the spirit were poured out seven chapters before christian was ever said i'm not here for christianity i'm here for god and i know i'm a christian don't take anything i'm saying the wrong way but i don't ever want to be more christian than i am biblical (laughs) just saying that sounds weird Hello. So we, we encounter these things. The Bible says, just, just in case, just so we're on the same page, the Bible says, let them praise his name in the dance. Part of the projection of Truth Church is that we would enhance things like this, that there would be more amening, that there would be more shouting hallelujah, that there would be more speaking in tongues, that there would be more aisle running, that there would be more dancing in the altar, because that's how God designed his people to operate in worship. We believe in saying amen as a church. Amen. That's not religious. It was a requirement in the formation of God's people that when the law would be recited, you go read, and I think it's the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34, I I believe. I could be wrong about that. But if you go and look, there will be time after time after time where the scripture will say, and the people said, amen. It was a requirement. If they didn't say amen, that meant they disagreed. There's too much disagreement in Christianity today, not on political issues, on church issues. Because we don't, somebody needs to get an amen in their spirit. And when the Bible says something, we need to say amen. And when the preacher says something, we need to say amen. And when the worship team's singing, we need to say amen. Because that means I believe what you're saying. I believe what you're preaching. I believe what we're singing. I believe in the God that we're talking about right now. We need a church that has an amen in its spirit. 
I'll tell you what has replaced the amen. A critical spirit has replaced the amen spirit. We need a spirit of move of God that says, I don't know why all of this is being said, but I'm committed to the word of God. And if it's in there, amen. If it's in the word, amen. You see, the, the reason that I bring this up it isn't just the fact that we've been asked these questions, and, and it isn't just the fact that we have lost people in this church. I, I, why be afraid of that? I, it, it's not just that people have left the church over these things. It's also because in today's world, some may say that these things are merely religious practices, that they aren't really necessary for us to please God. However, obedience to the word of God is never religious. Now, I, I want to be careful here because the Bible does talk about religion. We're going to read the scripture here in a little bit, but it talks about pure religion. What we see today in religion is not pure. It needs a cleansing with the word. Amen. So, obedience to the word of God is never religious, and this is important. Because this is where the contrast comes in. Religion has run a lot of people off. Corrupted religion has run a lot of people off. Religion has dropped the ball at times. Religion has caused some to waver in their faith. But you see, here's the difference between religion and what we're here for. When somebody is obedient to man, it's religious. But we aren't here for mankind at Truth Church. Amen. We're here for God. As much as we love visitors, you want to know why we can't be afraid to pray out loud in the altar? We're not here for visitors. We're here for God. You want to know why we can't be afraid of running people off when we're operating in the gifts of the Spirit? Because we're here for God. You want to know why we can't be afraid to get in the aisle a little bit? It's because we're not here for people. We're here for God. Amen. You see, sometimes we get so visitor-centric that we fail to be God-centered. We're here for God. We're here for the Savior. No offense, Brother Paul. I I'm going to say this to you because, because you just clapped when I said this. The visitor started clapping. You're not a visitor much longer here. You, you are officially a part of Truth Church, okay? I think this is your third or fourth time. But you see, I can't be afraid of what you think about my prayer life because I don't pray to you. You never saved me. You never delivered me. You never brought me out of the world. You never delivered me from drugs and alcohol. You never set me free. You never set my heart free when I was broken, when I was lost, when I was depressed. No, that was him. So I can't be here for you, and I can't be here for you, and I can't even be here for my own family. I come in here, and I worship because God is in this place. I praise because God is in this place. Can I tell you that when we we step out of religion and into relationship, it becomes easy to shout. It becomes easy to say amen. It becomes easy to dance because we love him. Thank you for letting me pick on you. Amen. First time I've met Dan, I don't know. How. You see, sometimes the value, just bear with me here. Sometimes the value of our practices in worship and sometimes the worship culture that we have in the church it gets scrutinized. And again, some may say that, that it is just not absolutely necessary. But I need to be abundantly clear here. I'm never asking you to obey me. I'm asking you to obey this. I don't want you to blindly follow me. I want you to follow me as the pastor of this church as long as I'm in this. And if I get out of this, you need to find a better church. Yeah. Praise God. You see, we aren't about religion here. We're about relationship here. We aren't about religion here. We are about the word here. Religion has had its way long enough, but now we need a revival in Christianity that produces an understanding of why we do what we do. We worship because it's biblical. We clap because it's biblical. We dance because it's biblical. We say amen because it's biblical. And Brother Weddle, some people may call it religious, but I call it apostolic. And some people may call it religious, but I call it Pentecostal. And some people may call it religious, but I call it revival that can change everything about your life. You see, this, this world has a lot of questions right now that the church needs to be ready for, and we have the answer, and I'm a, it just feels good, amen? 
it feels good because there's power that accompanies obedience to biblical principles. Amen. Now, we need to understand here, and I'm still laying the foundation. We're going to talk about Nicodemus here in a minute. It's 1120. Anybody in a hurry? The buffet at Tequila's is open till 2. And I want to go there today, so we're going to be out here at least by 1.30. I'm just joking. Don't get nervous. See, there's power that accompanies obedience to biblical principles. And it's important to understand that God is not just asking us to do these things for the sake of us doing these things. We're not here for his entertainment. We're here to worship him. Amen. We're here for his glory. Let me put it this way. God is not on his throne right now with a checklist saying, well, Brother McCain did this today. Brother McCain did that today. Brother McCain did this today. And I'm picking on him because he's a worshiper. But Brother Al, he, uh, I'll put a half check there because he only was, yeah. God, checklists are religious. God is not religious either. It's not about checking a box. It's not about checking a box off of your list. If it was that easy, most people would probably go to heaven. Amen. But James said this, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, do good things, check those boxes, but also keep yourself unspotted from the world. You see, religion has become spotted. We need revival that produces purity because purity will give you a power that religion could never give you. Purity and holiness and righteousness is the type of church that he is coming back for that I preached about last week. You see, understand here today that the difference between religion and revival is that religion is just repetition, saying things and doing things over and over and over. But saying things and doing things over and over and over, that's not going to change your life. Uh, there's a contrast between religion and revival, and revival changes how you think. Uh, revival changes how you talk. Uh, revival changes how you look. Uh, revival changes how you feel. That's the revival that we need. Because revival produces results. Revival actually does produce change. Amen. You see, these practices that the Bible teaches us, they are more than activity, and they're more than simple actions for people who desire to be called Christians. It's much more than that. When God gives an instruction, that instruction is meant to turn us into a butterfly. For those of you who haven't been able to come to the, the 930 Christian education, it's the will of God, and I'll, these are in the words of Pastor Weddle. He's done an amazing job with that, that series that ended this morning. But it's the will of God for you to fly over things that the world will tell you you have to crawl under. You see, the word of God will transform you, and there will be a shift in your life. And when we're discussing this contrast between religion and revival or or religion and relationship, there is no better person to study than Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus was neck deep in religion for most of his life. There's some amazing information out there on Nicodemus. And I, if I have an opportunity to share this at the end of the, the, the sermon today, I will. Because I, I have learned some things about Nicodemus myself over the last couple of years that are just profound. But if you study Nicodemus for the purpose of this, this sermon today, you're going to find that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. It's, it's not hard to figure that out because the Bible plainly tells us that in John chapter 3 that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And you see, religion had restricted Nicodemus in a way because it was religion that caused him to go and talk to Jesus in the night. This world doesn't need closet Christians. This world needs people strong enough and bold enough in their faith that they don't have to go to him by night when nobody's looking, but they're bold enough to talk to him when everybody's looking. God desires a church that's in a spotlight, not a closet. Amen. You see, man, Lord Jesus, help me. Christianity's been in the closet so long now that you see the results of it. But tonight, I believe that the church could make a public declaration. You see, 
It was religion that caused him to go and talk to Jesus in the night. He didn't want his fellow Pharisees to know that he was hungry for more than what religion was giving him. You want to know something right now? There have been more religious people sitting in our living room over the last couple years than what most people probably realize. And if not in our living room, we've been at lunch, we've been at dinner, we've been at this. Religion isn't feeding people anymore. We need revival. Amen. And that's where Nicodemus was. We would be surprised at how many Nicodemuses are in our world today. We would be surprised at how many Nicodemuses are in the church today, in Christianity today, hungry and starving, but unable to leave tradition, unable to leave this, unable to leave that. You see, he was hungry for more than this religion was giving him, and you begin to realize when you're reading about him that Nicodemus was hiding his relationship with God. The Bible says that he came to Jesus by night because he had some questions that went further than even what he knew, and he knew more than most. He was a, a leader of the Jews. He was a ruler. Man, I got to tell this story. In the Jewish study Bible, I, I have a Jewish study Bible. You need to buy one. It's, I think it's 30, 35 bucks. With inflation, it might be 45. I don't know. I bought it a couple years ago. But there's an excerpt. No, we're not going there. We're not going there. There's an excerpt. There's an excerpt in the Jewish study Bible that said, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Just by a showing of hands, did you know that a Pharisee could be born again six different ways? There were six different ways that a Pharisee could be born again. Two of those were for Gentiles, and Nicodemus was not a Gentile. So there were four ways for Nicodemus to be born again. The first one was bar mitzvah. That's a fairly familiar term. When you, when you get older, when you come of age, the, the Pharisaical law considered that a form of being born again. The second way was when you were married. Scripture said, or, or, or history reveals, that Nicodemus was married. The third way to be born again, that was being born again, married. The third way was to be a teacher, a rabbi. Nicodemus was a rabbi. He was a teacher. The fourth way was to become the head of a rabbinical school. That's what the Bible meant when it said ruler. He was the head of a rabbinical school. So Nicodemus, you need to understand what I'm saying here. Nicodemus had experienced the four ways that religion told him he could experience being born again. But religion wasn't fulfilling him. And he said, there's got to be more. And Jesus said, oh, 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 there's more, all right. Wait till you're born again of water and of spirit. Wait till you've been baptized in Jesus' name. Wait till you've been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it was here that Jesus introduced the principle that religion can't fulfill you, but relationship can. And religion can't fulfill you, but being born of water and spirit can. And that's not religious. It's spiritual. We need a revival. We haven't seen everything that God has for us. You see, Nicodemus was realizing, he came into that meeting, Brother Exler, saying, I've received everything I can. I've received everything religion has to offer me. But when just when we think we've seen all we can see and done all we've can done, Jesus said, no, 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 there's more for you. I came to tell somebody right now, I know you may have done a lot in the church, huh? but your ministry's just getting started. Huh? I know you've experienced a lot these last few weeks, huh? but God has more for you. Amen. This is when he comes into contact with this. Nicodemus wasn't just a Pharisee. He, he was on the Sanhedrin court. Now, just so we know what Sanhedrin is, that's like the Supreme Court. He had authority. He had power. He had money. He had influence. It still didn't fulfill him. Whew. Man, this court had significant authority. This court was compiled of men that, that held social status. And it wasn't just a religious court, it was a political court. So you start seeing the problems when politics mixes too much with religion. It, it ceases to be pure religion. And what this tells us is this, he had all of these things that the world desires, but he still wasn't fulfilled. Religion will always leave you empty. And this is how Nicodemus is introduced to us in Scripture, someone who seemingly had it all. And I, I'm not going to be too much longer but you see, all of this information is significant. Not only because Jesus taught him about the new birth, and, and not only because Jesus introduced what relationship can produce, 
But you see, it's significant because of what we read later in Nicodemus' life. Let's just be real here. There's a pressure on somebody to live righteous in today's world. We, we have some younger ears in the room today. We have some teenagers in the room today. It, peer pressure, listen adults, don't ever, don't ever forget how real that is. There's a pressure that comes with being the age that some of you are. I know what happens in Carbondale, Illinois. I, I know what happens on that campus. I've been a part of it. I've been kicked out of bars in that town. I know what happens when we are of a certain age where we've come into contact with religion, but we're not walking in pure religion. And what, what is the will of God? I'm going to tell you this right now. What is the will of God is this. For what you hear today to be what you live tomorrow. For what you hear today to be who you become tomorrow. And Nicodemus didn't fulfill that immediately. Nicodemus, we read in John chapter 3 that, that he came to Jesus by night and he remained a part of the Sanhedrin court. It was the Sanhedrin court that played a large role in crucifying Jesus Christ. They had to call on the Roman rule to, to actually crucify him. But the trial where they cried crucify him was at the Sanhedrin court, which Nicodemus was a part of. You see, we can crucify him even after we've experienced him. <sighs> but then when we get to John chapter 19, things are a little bit different. I need to be abundantly clear in somebody's life today. It's the will of God for your life to be different after this sermon. It's the will of God for your choices to look different. It's the will of God for your relationships to look different. It's the will of God for your language to be different. It's the will of God for your attire to be different. It's the will of God for your attitude to be different. You see, this is what we run into because religion will tell you that you don't have to change nothing. Relationship doesn't tell you that. Relationship tells you you got to change everything. <laughs> And in Nicodemus' case, things got a little bit different for him. This shift that it is the will of God for you to experience, it's the shift that he experienced because when we read of a man in John chapter 19, we read of him as a man who's ready to step out of religion and into public as a believer of Jesus Christ. You look to Scripture and the Bible says that this man who initially came to Jesus by night in private, afraid of what people would think, afraid of what his peers would think, afraid of what would happen to him and his societal status. That same man comes again in John chapter 19 to the court that he used to be a part of and says in verse 39, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes. You want to know what that, the significance there is that what he brought in those myrrh and aloes, that was a sacrifice. It was worship because it cost him a significant amount of money. Those were priceless possessions in that time. Do you see what's happening here in Scripture? And it says, they took the body of Jesus in the next verse and wound it in linen clothes with the spice. Nicodemus, you, you need to hear what I'm saying here right now. It's so powerful. Nicodemus experienced a shift in his life that required him to move out of the shadows and into the light. He required himself. He, he, he made the decision here to not keep it a secret that he worshiped the Lord. People need to know what your faith is. He made it known to people who could crucify him. More on that here in just a minute. He went from hiding it to proclaiming it. He went from a private relationship 
to a public response and he didn't care what it looked like. He didn't care how much he got ridiculed. He didn't care what it cost him. He didn't care about anything other than worshiping a savior who had just died for him on a cross. You're going to lose friends when you're walking in the righteous ways of God. You're going to lose relationships. You might lose money. You might lose money on investments. You might lose relationships and friendships. And you might even have relationships with family that doesn't look the way it used to look. But a public response is what it takes to take the body of Christ to a place where the resurrection is possible. I need you to understand what was happening here. Nicodemus busted out of his shell. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, he was on the Sanhedrin court as well. Those two individuals, they took the body of Christ to the tomb where redemption would come to pass, where revelation would come to pass, where salvation would be made possible. We're just one public response away from a revival that shakes this world. We're just one public response away from a revival that changes everything about the world we live in. This was Nicodemus saying, I'm done with religion. This was Nicodemus saying, I'm done with society's ways. This was Nicodemus saying, I'm done hiding it. Let me take the body of Christ to the place where everything we need is possible. You see, what I need somebody to understand right now is this. A public response from you could be exactly what the world is waiting on to see change. I need you to hear me right now. Your public response where you step out of your shell and you come out of the closet and you don't care what people think anymore and you don't care what people say anymore and you don't care what it costs you anymore, that could be the key to getting this church to the next phase. That could be the key to getting this church to the next harvest. That could be, I'm talking to somebody right now who is a world changer and when you walk out of that door, you need to make a public response. I know I didn't used to live for God, but now I do. I know I didn't used to live right but now I do and when they question you when they crucify you you can say I've seen the light I know what relationship feels like now I know what religion used to feel like but now I know what relationship feels like and it makes a difference as we're standing all across this place today I have a, a public service announcement revival might be waiting on you to go public. Revival might be waiting on you to dance in the altar. Revival might be waiting on you to lift your hands for the first time. Revival might be waiting on you to shout hallelujah for the first time. Revival might be waiting on you to step out of Christianity as the world knows it and step into relationship as Nicodemus found it. See, it was commonplace. It was commonplace in that time when somebody had been crucified. This is where many people will stay in the shadows. Because it was commonplace that after somebody was crucified, their family would come take their body. But if somebody not in the family came and took their body, they could be subject to the same punishment that the person who was crucified was. So let me tell you what it looked like when Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea came and asked for the body of Jesus Christ. They were willing to give it all in making a public declaration that the body of Christ was important to them. What are you holding on to this morning that is more important to you than the body of Christ? What is it that's holding you back from making a public declaration? What is it that is holding you back from lifting your hands for the first time? What is it that's holding you back from speaking in tongues for the first time? What is it that's holding you back from being baptized in Jesus' name? What is it that's holding you back from living for God 24-7 instead of just a few hours on Sunday. A public declaration is necessary because when you make a public declaration, you're letting God know, I don't care what it costs me. I want to live for you.
and perhaps the most public declaration we can make is when we come to the altar. Now we can acknowledge, biblically speaking, we, we can acknowledge that the altar didn't look like this when Noah built an altar. The, al the altar didn't look like this. We didn't, we didn't operate like this. But I want to be very clear here. The culture of this church is still very biblical. God can move anywhere you are. But sometimes God waits to move because he's waiting on you to move. And I've seen some people say, well, I don't need to go to the altar to receive the Holy Ghost. That's true. Well, I don't need to go to the altar to get a breakthrough. That's true. Well, I'll... but what if that's the one thing that... Because you want to know what an altar was for in the Old Testament? It was for sacrifice. It was for atonement. It was for redemption. It was for repentance. It was when God spoke to people and they had godly sorrow. They would stop what they were doing and build an altar unto the Lord. Let me tell you what happens when we make an altar call. You start building something in your life. You start building something that's letting the world know, I don't care who sees me. I don't care who's watching online. I don't care what my family says at the dinner table. I'm going to come to the altar and I'm going to talk to God because I'm going public with my relationship with Him. Can we flood this altar right now before we sing? Can we flood this altar right now? Come on, let's make a public declaration today. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care what it feels like.